lab osmolarity testing capability and incorporating into our practice really catalyzed a, a total change in our perception of uh, dry eye and, uh, and how we manage dry eye. And a big part of that uh, was getting our technicians, our optometrists, our uh, physician's assistants engaged in the whole process. And uh, we basically changed the whole way we managed dry eye, and the catalyst was, uh, was uh, the tear lab device. Is, what, what's been your experience? Has it been something like that? Very similar. It actually was the instrument that opened this entire field within our practice that we now call our dry eye center of excellence. We are able to do a variety of different types of tests. We are able to help these patients who come in. The entire conversation of dry eye disease was not there 10 years ago or 15 years ago. So it has absolutely catapulted this entire area in our practice. I absolutely agree. And the key was empowering the staff to get the initial check-in person or the initial tech who's taking the history to ask the appropriate questions and then initiate the path. So they do the survey and they find out the patient has these complaints, they know to go ahead and do the osmolarity. They may then funnel them down a path of other testing um, or other uh, questions and, and such to figure out where we're going. Because the key is knowing what you're treating. You can't just say, okay, this, this patient has mild symptoms, let's just throw tears. This patient has moderate symptoms, let's add restasis, let's add plugs. You wanna really know what's going on, you wanna make the diagnosis, you wanna be able to identify what the actual problems are. So now you might spend more time looking at the staining or looking at the breakup or doing a Shermer or whatever test you're gonna do. But the osmolarity triggers you right off the bat to know there's some sort of tear film surface problem. Yeah, and I would say, uh, you know, we do use this term dry eye center of excellence, which is perfectly appropriate. But what I found, and it all sort of was triggered by uh, the tear lab device uh, when we, when we uh, got that, I don't know, five or six years ago, uh, is that I, I actually prefer the term ocular surface disorders okay. center of excellence because this machine is, is, is as great as it's been at diagnosing dry eye and gauging severity and all of that, it's also helped me equally diagnose other ocular surface disorders when it's not dry eye, uh, you know, in a symptomatic patient in whom we get this test. Um, and again, if, you know, multiple tests, and, but if they're all normal, you know, 290, 290 in each eye, uh, but this patient is very symptomatic, it could be an itch, it could be foreign body sensation, it could be any of the overlapping symptoms that are common to all of the ocular surface disorders. And then I go, wow, it's probably not dry eye in this case. What is it? And I take a good close look at the, at the ocular surface and I find map dot fingerprint under the upper lid that sometimes is missed. Uh, certainly my fellows and residents miss that all the time. Um, or conjunctivicolasis or allergy or a whole host of things, uh, eyelid lagophthalmus, nocturnal lagophthalmus, um, all of these things. And I can hone in on that diagnosis and again, equally help my patients uh, by treating that as opposed to just dry eyes. And now a lot of times also it's comorbid. So you have dry eye, but you also have these other things as well. And so I think that, but the, the tear lab has sort of uh, driven all of that, you know, expanded ocular surface uh, awareness, which I think is, is tremendous. It's Including patients who wear contact lenses, yeah. actually. Oh, That's yeah. been it's a, a huge, huge area in our practice yeah. because so many patients would come to us complaining about the contact lenses were bothering them and they wanted to change a brand or change the way they were wearing them, it actually was through the tear labs, tear osmolarity testing that we realized what the problem was. And then once we rehabilitated their surface, they were much more comfortable in their contact lenses. That's helped our optometrists tremendously. And it, it can force you to look for other things, as you mentioned. How many times have we flipped the lids in these patients and found a surprise, how easily it averted, and you find out, okay, they have floppy lids, and you start asking them, and they say, yeah, I'm a heavy snorer, I've never been diagnosed with sleep apnea, and you can send them off for a, you know, to their primary care doctor for a sleep study, and you realize that may be an underlying problem. Or you see, you know, all the uh, giant papillae under their lid, and maybe they're having um, allergic problems that you wouldn't have detected. It just makes you look for things when you can't explain the answer. So it's made us, uh better clinicians, mm -hmm. I think, and the ophthalmologist is still in the middle of this. It's another nice, very useful data point that is helping us uh, make a plan and an appropriate diagnosis. 
But then we found also in our practice that, well, now we, we're making this diagnosis more frequently. We're making an appropriate diagnosis more frequently. We're able to direct our therapy more accurately. How are we going to treat anti-inflammatories versus omega-3s versus functional plugs versus when are we going to do things? And if we have a, a cataract patient who uh, has a dry eye and uh, we make uh, the diagnosis, I've always talked about we, we need to do an ocular surface preparation mm -hmm. if it's meaningful and then try to protect the surface during surgery. But another thing that a lot of us, I think, have, neg have neglected is that we fix the cataract, but they still have mm -hmm. ocular surface disease and they're going to have it for the rest of their lives. And I think it's important for the ophthalmologist either to assume the responsibility or delegate it to someone else to take care of that patient for the rest of the life mm -hmm. and make sure they're on an appropriate therapeutic regimen. Uh, and sometimes in our practice, we, we have now two going on three optometrists that just work full time. All they do is eye, uh, dry eye. And so I can sometimes delegate that if I don't want to do it myself or uh, make sure that a referring doctor tunes in and and takes care of them long term. Mm -hmm. So has that been something that you pay a little more attention to now to make sure those patients just, you know, they, they, you, you've now tuned in, you've made the diagnosis, you've gotten a better outcome in your cataract surgery, but we need to make sure we don't forget this is a lifelong disease and they need to be treated long term and that they know it and that we make sure it happens. I mean, how do you manage that? You know, many of these patients are subclinical when they present for the cataract evaluation. So that's where osmolarity is so useful. You may pick up somebody who's not really symptomatic, but they're 3.30 on their test, and you can, you know, start treating then. You can explain it to them then because you're going to push them over the edge with the surgery, and although they're asymptomatic pre-op, they may not be asymptomatic post-op. The other thing that's really important to add on to what you said, in that initial evaluation, I take an extensive amount of time to get them cleaned up, and I do multiple readings, manual K readings, topography readings, IOL master readings. I want to make sure everything correlates and that they all look clean. If they have a problem with this testing, I may bring them back multiple times. And it takes uh, quite a bit of counseling to tell the patient, I'm not going to do your surgery. You, we may have to wait weeks or months until we get your surface cleaned up. And I want to give you the best lens possible and the best result possible. And they seem to understand it, particularly when you have a concrete, objective piece of information that shows them that they have a problem. And you really need to take that time to counsel them and get them cleaned up before you jump into surgery or they won't have a good result. I do exactly what Ken does, too. I talk to my patients, and at times it does take two or three months out, not often, but at times, to bring these patients to the level where I can trust the data preoperatively to get them a good result. Patients initially don't like hearing that because they were all emotionally set to have their cataract surgery, but they really truly appreciate that you're doing everything possible to give them the best surgical outcome. And the word I use with my patients is forever. You have dry eye disease, I always say forever, because that kind of gets it across to them that they're never going to get rid of it. We can't cure it, but we can always keep you, what I say, on track so that your eyes feel good and you feel good. So now we have that uh, patient with chronic dry eye in our practice, and just like the glaucoma patient, let's say we've got them on a regimen where they're reasonably well managed and we're going to see them every six months. You know, that would be typical for me. Mm -hmm. Everything's going okay, and they're on an artificial tear and an omega-3 and maybe doing a little high, a lid hygiene. Maybe they're on restasis. And, but they're kind of stable and everything is okay. But still, I'm bringing them back every six months. Mm -hmm. They may decompensate in Minnesota in the winter, like <laughs> they do in New York. But when they're coming back for that routine maintenance, just like if you were doing glaucoma, you'd be doing a pressure every time and maybe an OCT of the nerve one time and a field the next. Do you get a cure from osmolarity every time? I mean, is it uh, you, helpful? Yeah, you, I wouldn't say every time, but yes. If the patient um, is, if the patient is, says, I feel 100% better, I'm not using, or I'm using maybe some restasis twice a day or an artificial tear just once a week or something like that, and I have no symptoms, then my technicians would probably actually not get the tear osmolarity at that point, no, thinking that they're um, stabilized. Um, but if there's any, um, any change at all from the previous visit, uh, certainly any worsening symptom or oh, I'm using artificial tears more often, I think that's an important metric in addition to osmolarity and, and others, uh, how many times are you using artificial tears, um, then yes. Uh, and mo more often than not, we get the osmolarity on each visit. I think it's a great way of, of, of measuring uh, efficacy of our treatments. Yeah. 
That's why seeing these patients at regular intervals, like you mentioned, Dick, six months or so, is very important because, as we discussed, it's a chronic disease. And when patients feel good, what do they do? They stop using their medications because they say, my eye feels great. I don't need to use X, Y, and Z. So coming to us and we as clinicians reinforcing the importance of them staying on therapy, otherwise they're going to regress back to square one is really important. I'm more, I'm more like uh, the two of you in that I, I want that number every time I see them. So for me, I, I just can't imagine, uh, uh, you know, and I still, we still have our skeptical colleagues, but I just can't imagine, you know, practicing, and I agree with your idea of ocular surface disease with, without this test. I mean, I, I, I don't, uh, I wouldn't want to do this any more than I would want to go, go take care of my glaucoma patients without being able to measure their pressure. I mean, does it kind of become indispensable to you? Absolutely. And we use it all the time. It's an integral part of a patient workup, and we're delighted that we have these tools available to help our patients with their ocular surface disease. On those rare occasions early on when we first adopted it, where we would run out of cards on a given day, I felt like I was working one-handed without it. I'm so used to having that number that when it's missing, I really notice it. Unfortunately, we don't run out of cards anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would, I would use the word devastated, quite frankly. And I'm not trying to be dramatic here. It's actually legitimate. I, if, I, if that machine was taken out of my office, because I, I mean, dry eye is probably by far the number one thing that I see, or your patients with these ocular surface uh, issues. And, uh, you know, it's so, it's such a necessity for me at this point um, that I would feel very much lost and, and hurt if, if I didn't have that, that, that machine. So what are your residents and fellows doing uh, if you talk to some of them when they join uh, a group that doesn't have it? Are they, uh, are they, uh, they push for messianic it. on it? Are they? You, you, yes, absolutely. And, uh, and there's really no good reason to, to not have, I mean, it's so useful clinically. Well, I find that to be very valuable uh, discussion. Uh, as always, I learn a lot when I get to sit down with my experienced colleagues, and I, I really enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the discussion, and I hope that uh, you did as well.